Happy Sabbath. All I can say is wow to that choir because I love hearing the choir sing every time they get up here. But that last number was incredible. Thank you for that. Well, it's sort of a bittersweet moment for me at the moment because as far as I can tell, this will be the last time I stand here before you with a, a message and I mean, bitter, of course, because uh, I've enjoyed uh, each time up here this, this experience, but sweet because I know that God has great things in store, and I'm excited. Look forward to that. As you can see, it appears that spring is just around the corner, and that is exciting for me. Soon, you know, the birds will be singing. The, the bees will be buzzing. The air fragrant, fragrant with the, the scent of the flowers. The grass will be green once again. The trees will be budding. Yes? It's my favorite time of the year. Spring is a season of new life. It's a season of hope, joy, and indeed it is a season of romance. And so I think that it is fitting that today we look at what I believe to be the most romantic story in all of Scripture. But it's not just my intention to warm your hearts today, to to create emotions within you, but it's my hope that as we look at this story, we can gather insights that are applicable to our lives, to our world and our situation today because we live in a world today where many people seek to find happiness, to find satisfaction in love and in romance. But it is a satisfaction that can only be found if our lives are truly surrendered to God's will. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, I pray that your blessing will be poured out upon us. May the Holy Spirit guide our hearts and our minds, and Lord, I pray that you will guide my lips as I, as I uh, speak to the congregation this morning. Lord, I pray that uh, uh, it'll be a message from you, not just from me. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, perhaps it is this way with all young people. <clears throat> There's a tendency for us to look to the future. It may have been that way for you. Perhaps those of you who are a little older, you may have experienced that in your youth. I know that it was that way for me. I had this idea that when I became an adult, 18, 19, maybe 20 years old at the latest, I was going to get married. And so I was continually looking ahead to this idea in my mind. And as I was, I would go about my life considering the options, looking for potential suitors to fit my goal. And yes, even in, at times, these, uh, this would turn into relationships that would occur in my life. And as the statistics seem to show, most relationships that occur in childhood, even high school romances, there are those few that, yes, they turn into something long-term, something permanent, but most relationships from childhood do not last. And, of course, that was the case for me. Some of these relationships ended without incident, no harm done, but, yes, there were those that caused pain heartache, devastation that I wish I could not, would not have had to experience. And I reached a point in my life during college at one point where I had uh, come to a point of desperation. And I said, Lord, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of 
putting my efforts and seeking a relationship and trying to make something work that just isn't working. And so, Lord, I want to put it all in your hands. And I, and I prayed this prayer and I said, God, if there is a woman out there for me, let her figure out what it is that she wants and she can come to me. <laughs> Little did I know at that moment that shortly after my prayer would begin to receive an answer. See, my first encounter with the woman who would one day became, become my wife took place over here at College View Church one night at a Vesper service. And she was singing special music that night. And when she sang, it was music to my ears. I wondered, who is this girl? I've never seen her before. How is it that I've never heard her sing? I've never seen her on campus before. And I wanted to know who she was. So like anybody in my position, I went back to my college dorm room and I pulled out my PG, which for those of you who don't know, this is the, the social information center for Union College where you can find anything you need to know about any person. Well, not anything, but the basics. And so I scanned the pages looking for that face, and there she was, Emily Yancer. No, she was not from Minnesota, but that could be forgiven, I suppose. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, I was working over at the cafeteria at Union Market, and who should happen to come through the line for lunch one particular day, this girl that I had seen, Emily answer. And she had never come through the lunch line before. I know, I would have noticed. <laughs> but there she was, and she was coming my way. And it was at that time that we would have our first conversation, our first face-to-face -face encounter. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Is there veggie meat on that sandwich? I said to her. And she replied very simply, yes, there is. Yes, that, young men, is how you get the girl. <laughs> Love was in the air. And she went on her way. And another day came, perhaps the next week, a couple days later. Here she comes through the line again. We would have this encounter a number of different times, never more, never less to our conversation. But each time, my interest in her began to grow. There was something about her that seemed to stand out in the crowd. She was different from all the other girls that I had seen. Little did I know that our increasingly frequent encounters were not just a coincidence. No, she had seen me. She had noticed my rugged good looks a little while back and so she had and she had taken note of my work schedule and made her lunch time to coincide with when I would be at work so that we could have these romantic encounters <laughs> yes I did not realize that from that moment my prayers were beginning to find an answer and how many of us find ourselves in a situation of desperation we have put our own efforts forth in attempt to make something happen that just is not working, and we are at a breaking point. Those of you who are married, it is no longer about, and you know, you look back on those, those days with sort of amusement maybe, but the journey does not end there. The frustration, the desperation does not necessarily end there. Even in following God's will in our marriages, Things are bound to happen which bring us trial. And we reach this point where we are faced with difficulties and faced with desperation, desperate times. Those of you who may not be married but you're in a relationship, maybe this isn't your first relationship, maybe you've been in a relationship before and it just hasn't worked out, and there's this frustration of, God, how do I know if this relationship or what can my, I do to make this relationship different from the previous ones that have not worked those who are single uh, you may face pressures feeling from other people this I, this 
this idea that there's an expectation for you to be married at some point, and yet there's been no success. For those who are even teenagers and children, yes, uh, it seems to be that relationships of some sort are taking place at an earlier age, and, and, and hopefully you have not yet experienced some of the heartache and the frustration that relationships can bring. But there will come a point where we ask ourselves, what can I do to make this different for me? As parents, we look at our children. We look back at the frustration, the pain that we experienced at their age or in, their, in the youth, and we hope that they don't have to go through that. Pastors, teachers, anybody who has a relationship or some influence in the life of children, you may at some point feel this burden to protect, to nurture, to care for the children, for the youth, for the young people in the church. Well, for, fortunately, we are not alone in our experience. In fact, the Bible speaks of many people who in one way or another have looked for fulfillment in love and in romance. And we, we look at one of these stories today in Genesis chapter 24. And so if you have your Bibles with, me, please, uh, with you, please turn to Genesis chapter 24. And now you may uh, turn to this chapter and realize you recognize this story and say, wait a minute, you promised me that we were going to be looking at one of the most romantic stories in all of the Bible. And I know this story. And it is not romantic at all. It is a story of an arranged marriage. Well, I would like to say that if you stick with me, you will see that this is indeed the most romantic story in all of Scripture. So Genesis chapter 24 is where we begin, and we'll start with verse 1. It starts with the setting. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Yes, Abraham was growing very old at this point in his life. He's 140 years old. The time of his death seems to be fast approaching, and God has blessed him in all things. It is now time for him to look to the future, to his son's inheritance, and to be sure that everything is secure for his future. And in fact, as the Bible says, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. There was only one area, one point of concern which Abraham still had, one matter yet to attend to, and that was that Isaac had not yet married. And so Abraham uh, wishes to make that, uh, make that happen. And yes, we see that it is Abraham seeking the wife, not Isaac. And you know, Isaac could have very well chosen to find his own wife, Esau, did that, we see. We see uh, David, King David chose his own wife. Um, Samson chose his own wives. And so it was not necessarily mandatory that he had to let his father choose his wife, but he trusted the wisdom and the godly experience of his, of his father Abraham. And so uh, we continue to look at the story and we see that Abraham actually, because he is old, he entrusts the, the labor, uh, the task, to his most trusted servant, Eliezer. And he, they agree upon two stipulations. Number one, do not take a wife for Isaac from the Canaanites. You know, they lived among these people, and, and they had seen uh, the way they lived their lives, and God had in fact told them that one day you will inherit this land. The people who live here, they will be cast out because their iniquity is only going to continue to increase. And so Abraham said, no, a Canaanite woman is not fit for my son. So I want you to go to my kindred over in Haran, for at least they have a worship of the true God. These were the most godly women that Abraham could think of. So number two, he said, do not at any cost take my son Isaac over to Haran. She must come here because God has promised this son uh, this land to my son in the future. It is, it is his inheritance. And if he goes back, he will be tempted to stay and not be uh, in accordance with God's will for his life. And so 
they agree upon these two things, and Eliezer makes the journey. He packs up ten camels full of, full of things, all the food and provisions that he will need, and he makes his journey 500 miles to the, the town of Nahor in the land of Haran. How many days the journey lasted, we do not know, but he arrives at, at evening, the time when the women come to draw well. And because Eliezer recognizes the great burden that he holds, the sacredness of the task at hand, what does he do? But of course, he follows the example that his master Abraham has taught him. And he bends his knee in prayer to God. And we read his prayer in verses 12 to 14. Then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, Please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, Drink, and I will also give your camels drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Yes, Eliezer prays this prayer. And before he is even done speaking, his prayer begins to find an answer. He lifts up his eyes and he sees this woman who has come to the well. She has gotten her water and she is about to leave and not wishing to miss out an opportunity. He gets up off his knees and he runs over to where she is and she says, He says, please, may I have a drink of water? And yes, she offers him a drink, and he gets done drinking. And we read in verse 19, uh, uh, well, she she offers to water his camels as well, and it says, uh, oh, in verse 19, when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Can you imagine the, the surprise that, he's, that he must have experienced? The very first woman who he has approached and asked for a drink, could it be possible? She is offered to water his camels. And so he stands there and he watches her the entire time she's watering the camels. Now at this point, I know all of you are wondering the same thing that I am. There's a burning question in your mind. How much water can 10 thirsty camels drink? <laughs> well, I, I looked up to find the answer to this question just because I had to know. How long was he standing there watching her? Well, turns out one thirsty camel, and we don't know how long these ones had gone without water, but a thirsty camel can drink anywhere from 30 to 50 gallons of water at one time. So it is, it is quite possible, th- maybe three gallons at a time, she pours 300 gallons of water in a trough to have these camels drink. And so the entire time, Eliezer's watching her, wondering, is it possible that God is fulfilling my prayer right here before my very eyes? And indeed, she gets done watering the camels, and Eliezer is convinced. And he is so excited. He, he talks to her. He gives her a reward, a thanks, a thanks, and ends up going to the house of her family and finding lodging there and dining with them. <clears throat> and there at the meal, he is so excited to share his news, the, the experience that he has had, how God has answered his prayer that we... We look at what verse 33 says. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. Yes, it is a custom in the Middle East at this time to eat first and then do business later. But Eliezer has just had this incredible experience, this revelation from God, and he is so excited that he says, I cannot eat until I tell you what has just taken place. And so he goes through the entire experience, how he's come all the way to find a wife for his master, and how he prayed this prayer, and he found an answer to that prayer, and the answer to that prayer was Rebecca, the daughter of this household. 
And the response to uh, Eliezer's testimony is found in verses 50 and 51. Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. Now again, you're saying, see, there's no romance in this whatsoever. She's treated like a, a, a piece of livestock. She's an animal. She just said, sure, take her. She's yours, right? Well, no, that's not exactly true because Eliezer prepares to leave the very next day. He says, I want to get back. I'm in a hurry. I'm excited to bring uh, Rebecca back to my master. I would like to leave today. And her brother says, no, no, no. She must stay and celebrate. And we have to uh, bid her well and say goodbye. Give her time to stay here. And, and they say, let us see what she will have to say. So she has her opportunity. Here is her moment to say, you know, I don't even want to go anyway. But in verse 58, they ask her, Will you go with this man? And Rebecca, she has heard the testimony. She has heard Eliezer's experience and heard how God answered his prayer. And she says, yes, I will go. She chose to accept the call that God placed upon her life. Yes, she was, she was beautiful. She was pure. She was a very good woman. Indeed, she was probably the choice of all the guys around. Yet she was simply going about her daily business, doing what was before her and doing that task faithfully. The act of watering the, uh, the camels for the man was not something that was expected by custom, but it was something that she volunteered to do to go above and beyond what was expect of her, expected of her. She was doing what God had given her to do, and doing it well. And while she was doing these things, it was, it was in that moment that God placed a calling upon her life to be somebody's wife. And so she accepted. And Eliezer takes her, and they return to Canaan, and they get there, and, she, and Isaac sees the caravan coming off in the distance at the time of evening, and what is Isaac doing? He is doing what he has been taught as well, and that is pray to God. And he sees the caravan coming, and she sees him off in the distance, and she makes herself ready. She prepares herself to meet her husband. She veils her face. And we read in verse 66, And the servant, Eliezer, told Isaac all the things that he had done. You can imagine his excitement as he was excited telling Laban and Bethuel the story, he's even more excited to tell Isaac because it is his wife that he has brought. And he relates the very same details that he has he related to uh, Rebecca's family. And then we read in 67, Isaac brought her into his mother's tent. He gave her a place to stay. And he took Rebecca. And she became his wife. And, look at those next words, he loved her. See, I told you it was a love story. Why does he love her, though? Number one, yes, she is beautiful. She's wearing a veil, but when she takes that veil off, it's like, wow, no way. But also, he heard this story and found out she is indeed a woman of virtue. She didn't have to water those camels, but she went above and beyond. She is a diligent woman, and she will make a great wife. But the other reason, the biggest reason why he loves her is because he heard this story of Eliezer's prayer and how, how God would reveal this woman, and he found out that God had chosen this woman just for him. And how could he not love the very woman who was chosen for him by God? He did not have to ask her a long list of questions. He did not have to find out if they were compatible. Of course, they were going to be compatible, but he knew that she had been chosen for him by God. Yes, happiness, true love 
is experienced in those marriages that are arranged by God. When we follow God's leading in our lives, especially in our relationships, we can be certain that he will bless us. And the happiness that we find will often, no, will always be greater than when we follow our own plans. If we choose to follow our own methods or if we seek after our own interests. For those of us who are married, you know, we, we have gotten here one way or another. But the journey has not ended and, and we will come across hardships, we will com- come across difficulties, and if we keep God first in our life, those difficulties, those trials, will not be our ruin, but instead they will be opportunities for us to grow, to become stronger, to fall in love even more. For those who are in relationships, not yet married, you're wondering, is this the person for me? Is this relationship going to be different than the last one? The key to knowing that question, the key to happiness in that relationship or in letting go of the relationship is to follow God's will. For those who are single, yes, we all have this desire at some point to find somebody to be a companion with. It is a God-given desire, yet if we do not surrender that desire to God, if we follow our own wishes, our own wills, we will not find that happiness that we are looking for. Young people, children, who are surrounded by this culture that tells us love is the answer to all of our needs. In music, which is this emotional experience, the lyrics tell our children, I need this love, I need that love, I need this relationship. The movies, and by the way, I believe that especially when we're children, we are more driven by our emotions, what our emotions tell us we are not able to think reasonably as well as we are when we are adults. And so these emotional experiences that we experience even through entertainment and advertising, they are more compelling. They say, yes, I need a relationship like that. I need to find love. And of course, as parents and pastors, teachers, grandparents, we think, what can I do that my children or that our children's lives, their experiences may be different than mine. And, you know, it's not just this simple idea of, well, I'm just going to lay down the law and say, until you are old enough to sign a marriage license, there will be no relationships in this house. Because we know that wouldn't work. But perhaps we can guide and teach And to lead them to always seek the Lord's counsel. To to ask, to pray, is this what God wants for me at this time? Yes, because I believe as Christians, we are called to live a life that is different from what the world lives. We are called to live a life in surrender to God's will in everything that we do. Yet, This area of relationships is one of the areas where we often struggle to follow God's will. After all, it is my life. I want to find somebody that I'm going to like. I want to make sure that they like me. I want to make sure that we have things in common, interests that coincide with one another. And often, since our goal is a lasting loving, God-filled relationship, the model of accomplishing that goal must be different from the model that the world is given. You know, statistics show that the divorce rate of about 50%, I believe it was, that Pastor Michael shared, it is not much different from Christians to non-Christians. And it's perhaps because our model of building relationships, the foundation, perhaps too much like what the world offers. Perhaps we can take lessons from this story and we can follow what Isaac 
did who, no, we cannot, I'm not suggesting we necessarily let our parents choose for us who we are to marry. It may not necessarily work in our society, but we can indeed seek the counsel of godly parents or godly uh, older, older folks, pastors, teachers, those who are close to us. We can seek their counsel not just in a person that we choose, but whether we ourselves are ready for a relationship, whether we are ready for this relationship. We can like, be like Abraham, who set the standards high and said, this is the kind of woman who my son should marry, and I will not compromise that standard just to accomplish my desire to give him a wife. Like Eliezer, we can commit the matter continually to prayer. Before we venture forth into a relationship, before we seek to get to know a certain boy or girl a little bit better, we can seek the counsel of the Lord. Say, Lord, guide me in in my decision. Guide me in my actions. And like Rebecca, we can be faithful in what God has given us to us to do on a daily basis, to develop our characters, develop ourselves spiritually, focus on our education, focus on the, the relationships we have with family, and strengthen all those things, and simply wait and trust God that in his timing, he will bring a relationship to us. I began this sermon with a story about how I met my wife and how cruel it would be if I did not finish that story. And, but, you see, it was only when I fully surrendered myself to God's will and timing that I began to experience the answer to my prayers and to experience his leading in my life. Yes, that semester was drawing to a close and we had not yet had a real conversation. Her, my interest in her was getting, uh, was growing. And I w- wanted to get to know her, but I wondered, is this simply my will or is it God's will? How can I know? Well, the semester ended and I went home for winter break, for Christmas break, and I was relaxing, recouping from a long semester, keeping in touch with friends. When I got this online message from somebody whom I had never met before, but they went to the college over here. And it was a message asking if I would be interested in going on a blind date with this person's friend. And I thought, hmm, some girl I've never met, no idea who her friends are, sure, why not? I'm a little bit adventurous like that, and I think, well, what's the worst that could happen? But after agreeing to this, you know, my curiosity was getting the best of me, and my mind was churning, thinking, who could this possibly be? And I began scanning the friends list of this person online and really didn't come to anything very helpful. I mean, there was one girl in there who I knew, and I thought, well, it could be her, and that'd be all right, but wouldn't it be interesting I have no idea if they're friends even, but this girl, Emily Yancer, wouldn't it just be strange if it happened to be her? And we, I was talking to this girl, and she said, well, you know, if you really want to know who, I suppose, I mean, it's not really a blind date after all. She knows who you are. So I could tell you who she is. I said, yeah, I'd like to know. And she t- said, her name is Emily Yancer. I was like, what are the odds? What are the odds? And perhaps this is what Eliezer was thinking as he watched Rachel, as she was the very fulfillment of the prayer that he had just prayed. Having experienced it myself a little bit, I can imagine the excitement that he must have had to sense God's leading in his life right before his very eyes. And you see, from this moment on, it was something inside of me that said, this is God leading. And believe it or not, I'm not even sure my wife believes it, but I say that from that moment, before I had even met 
her officially, I began to love my wife before she was my wife. Nothing mattered to me except that I believed God had brought us together. He was leading us together. And no, not every experience will be just like mine. Not every experience will be like Isaac's. I don't even think everybody's experience will be clear. But I do believe that when we seek God's will in all that we do, he will let us know. He will make it clear whether we are following his will or whether we are following his, uh, our own will. And of course, it is only by following God's will that we can find true happiness in love and in our relationships. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to follow you in all that we do. We want to give you our life in all its difficulties and all its trials, Lord. Sometimes we feel like we can handle things on our own or that we can just manage our own, our own life because it's just, it's just who we are, Lord. We, we are independent people. But Lord, we, we realize that our own efforts do not always end up the way we want them to. And so, Lord, we want to place our lives in your hands, Lord. May we be fully surrendered to your will for our life. And we ask that you guide us in all that we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.